All right. Okay. Welcome back, everybody, to our second lecture on uh, interpreting scripture. In the previous lecture, we talked about, uh, we went through on uh, looking at culture and interpreting, um, interpreting the scripture text in the context of uh, culture. So we're going to now look at one more or one other principle in interpreting scripture, go on to the next one and uh, talk about grammar. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my PDF. Now, if, uh, yeah, I hope I don't lose connection here in any way. All right, okay. So another important part of uh, interpreting scripture is following the uh, simple grammar of the text. Now, uh, the, the, so every language, every language, whether it's Hebrew or Greek or English, follows certain uh, semantics or rules of uh, grammar and how the words are put together and the meaning of uh, the, the words, the tense of the words and so on. And so uh, we have to follow those or understand and follow those rules and also interpret the text keeping simple grammar in mind. For, for instance, um, of course we want to know the meaning of the word. So if a word can have more than one meaning, then obviously we have to use the meaning that was intended by the person who was writing or the meaning that was that that is most appropriate in that sentence structure, right? So that's what we do even in English, where if one word could have more than one meaning, then you know immediately we process it and we say, oh, this is what he means. Why? Because of the sentence in which it is used or uh, what was intended by the person who is speaking to us, the, given the context and all of that. We understand that, mean, okay, this is what he means. So even though one word could have multiple meanings, we go over the meaning that is intended or that is most appropriate in that sentence. Some other things in grammar is we look at the tense of the word. You know, is it past tense? If it's past tense, mean it's already done. If it's future, okay, it's going to happen. Uh, we also look at whether it's masculine or feminine or whether it's neutral, you know. So if a word is neutral, then it could apply to both men and women. If a word is meant, you know, if it's about a men, it's men. No, ladies, talk about ladies. So we understand those things, right? And so uh, we have to stay consistent with these basic principles of, of grammar, which doesn't matter which language, Hebrew or Greek or English, those principles of grammar apply. So therefore, when we're interpreting scripture, we have to keep these simple rules of grammar in mind. So for example, I'm just giving example, uh, Matthew chapter four, verse four. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, one wrong way to interpret that, which is a misuse of grammar, it's not following grammar, is, oh, he said man. You know, it's translated as man. So this verse is only for men. No. So what do you do? You go into the, uh, the Greek. The Greek word is actually anthropos. Anthropos is, simply means human. It is gender neutral. 
it applies to men and women. Now in English, especially in Old English, we use the word mankind uh, in a gender neutral way. You know, when, when uh, we used to say mankind, uh, uh, it meant both men and women. But of course, now we have, you know, just to be more explicit, we use the word people or we use the word humankind. Um, but so that word man or simply refers to mankind. Or if you go into the Greek, it is anthropos, which is human, man or woman. So Matthew 4.4, 4, if you put it in a modern way, it says people will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Right? So a wrong interpretation example would be to say Matthew 4.4 4 is only for men, only for male. No, no, no. It is gender neutral. It applies to everybody, male and female. Uh, we live by uh, by the word of God, right? So if we are not careful like this, you know, like there are many other instances where uh, if we miss out on the tense or if we miss out on uh, what could be the right meaning of the word, if a word has multiple meanings, uh, we need to say, okay, you know, what exactly did he mean? Or could he also have meant that? That means I'm also including, if it's not very clear, I should also include, he could have also meant this. And so I need to keep that also in mind as I interpret the scripture text, right? So we are trying to understand, you know, the meaning of the word and the, the relationship of the word in that sentence and how that word functions. Is it for male, for female? Is it past? Is it present? Is it future? And so on. So these are things that, you know, we should take in mind, keep in mind when we are uh, interpreting the text and we're using simple rules of grammar that apply to any language that, uh, you know, that, that may be used. So the example of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of, 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 you know, trying to look into the meaning of the word, right? Just one example, right? Um, and uh, when we spoke last week, uh, we talked about Bible study tools. So, so this is where the Bible study tools come in, come in. It's very useful where you can look up the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the word in the original language. So you can, and of course it's been translated into English, but if you look up the Greek or you look up the Hebrew, uh, you can look at the original word and the, you try to understand the meaning or the meanings of the original word, because sometimes the word could have had more than one meaning. And you also look at, is it a noun? Is it a verb? Uh, you know, is it, may, is it masculine, feminine? You know, those kind of things. So that you get a clear understanding of, okay, this is what is being said, right? So, uh, I, you know, we could pick up many examples, but uh, let's say in Romans 1.16, um, the uh, Apostle Paul is saying, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Right? So you go look up the Greek word power. It's dunamis. Now, uh, in English, of course, it sounds very much like dynamite, but uh, it's not necessarily talking about dynamite. It's talking about anything... It's talking about any uh, ability to be done, the work that can be done, right? What can be done. So it's okay, the gospel is the power of God. It is what God does. It's the work of God, the ability of God, uh, uh, resulting in salvation. So he's talking about that, right? Now, the... Same word, dunamis, 
is also used. I'm just giving an ex extending this example now because you've looked into the word dunamis. You understood it means ability, divine ability or supernatural ability. Um, that same word dunamis is now if you look at Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Now I'll just open up my e sword. Um, uh, Luke 10, 19. And you look it up in the King James Version. Are you you're all able to see my screen, right? Yeah. Yes, Pastor. Oh, okay, thank you. So you look at Luke 10, 19, right? Now, you're reading it in English. It says, Behold, I give to you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will by any means hurt you. So you read it in English, and you have the word power that is used twice in this verse. Now, you know, in English, oh, power, you might think it's the same thing. But this is where doing, going into the language and looking, the, looking up at the language is very useful because you find here there are two different Greek words that are translated as power, right? So... And the, using a Bible study tool is very helpful because now if I look at the Greek word power here, this word power, behold, I give unto you power, is the Greek word exousia. Uh, so it's different from dunamis. It is exousia. Oh, and exousia is really talking about delegated power. You could see that in the meaning here. Or if you look it up and, you know, he's talking about delegated influence. That's the focus. You know, he's talking about something that is given uh, uh, to somebody, right? It's a privilege, privilege, something that's given as a privilege or a delegate, delegation. Whereas the second word power, you look it up, it's dunamis. And this dunamis is force, it's ability. It's what someone is able to do. It's, it's supernatural, it's miraculous, it's mighty. It's talking about ability, right? So there is a difference here between these two words, power that is translated in English. So if you want to correctly understand this uh, by looking at the, you know, the usage of the word, what Jesus is saying is, I'm giving you delegated authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the dunamis, the ability of the enemy. That means you're given authority over the ability. But in English, you know, they've, uh, they've translated it power. Because, of course, in, in, in English, the word power could mean influence, it could mean uh, position, it could mean physical ability. That word, one word power in English could, you know, depending on how it's used, means so many things. But in the Greek, it's a little bit more specific. You have the first word that means authority or something that's delegated. It means privilege. And the second word it has to do with ability, force, strength, what someone is able to do. So how do we understand? He has given us authority over what the devil is able to do. Uh, and, and nothing will any by any means hurt us. So now this verse becomes a little clearer when you look into the word and do a little language study like the, studying the grammar, the language, uh, and say, oh, there is authority that God, the Lord has given me. He's given me privilege. He's given me delegated authority over the ability. So the devil can do what he wants to do, but I've got authority over that. Right? So looking into the language, this is one example how you try to get into the meaning of the word, and that enables us to understand, uh, you know, a, a little better than just, uh, because in English we're using the same word power, but in the language in the Greek, uh, different words are used. Oh, but can I ask one question here? Please go ahead, yeah. 
Uh, but in uh, Second Timothy chapter one verse seven, uh, mm-hmm. we read power, love, and of sound mind. Mm. Uh, so uh, that power is also ability. I think uh, the Greek for that is also Second Timothy one. Yeah, yes, this is dynamis. So uh, yeah, so in in for the believer. What and, and, and as you study the word power, which is a very nice thing, because good you brought it up, you will find that Holy Spirit power is always dunamis. Authority in the name of Jesus is always exosia. You know, so for example, uh, we keep Second Timothy one seven. Keep it in mind, and if you go to uh, uh, Acts one eight. You know, when Jesus said, you will receive power, what is that dunamis? When the Holy Spirit comes on you. So what the New Testament is teaching us is the Holy Spirit is bringing God's ability into us. The work, the very work of God is done through us. That is power. So Holy Spirit power, the word power always in the context of the Holy Spirit is dunamis. It's divine ability being released through the believer, miraculous power being released through the believer. But when it comes to delegation, the New Testament uses the word authority, uh, exosia. Uh, He's saying, you know, you have authority in my name to cast out demons. That is the difference. So, uh, so I'm sorry I didn't let you ask your question. Let's go to Second Timothy one verse seven. Uh, uh, what was your actual question? Sorry. Uh, also, my question was the power mentioned here is also the ability, or is it uh, something related to the authority? Mm. Yeah. So this is one. This is ability, dynamis. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of divine ability, because that is Holy Spirit power and of love, and of a son. So the Holy Spirit brings within us divine ability. He brings within us love, and he brings within us soundness of mind. It's okay. Yes, Pastor. Yeah, thank you. So like this, you know, it is good to get into the grammar, get into the language bit. And thank God we have tools today. Uh, We can use the tools to understand the Hebrew and the Greek language. Uh, we don't have to go and study Hebrew or study Greek. You just make use of the tools and the dictionaries uh, that will tell us, you know, okay, this is a noun, this is a verb and so on. So uh, like this, you can study many words, you know. So for example, the other thing, very interesting, and I'll, I'll just share a few things, okay. I, uh, you know, there's so much, but for example, if you look at the word faith and belief, faith and belief, you'll find that they both come from the same root word. In English, we have two different words, faith, belief, right? But um, so if you, uh, let's look at those words. Uh, they, they come from the same root word, you know? So um, uh, Romans chapter four, it's talking about Abraham, who against hope believed, right? Pistio, pistio. The word believe or believed, the Greek word is pistio. Now, notice it, it says, it literally means to have faith. And if you look at it a little closely, uh, the word believe, uh, it will tell us, you know, I think Thea, Thea will tell us, or it's a verb, right? It's a verb. Pistio. Now, if you look at the word faith, faith comes from a similar word pistis, faith. And it's talking about the same thing, and it's a noun. Right? It's a noun. So you understand that the word faith, pistis, and the word believe, they actually come from the same root word. So they are speaking about the same thing. You know, if you have to have faith is to believe. To believe is to have faith. Just that faith is a noun 
Belief is a verb. Belief is the doing of it. Faith is the possessing of it. That is, you have faith. So that's it. So really, they can be used interchangeably. They can be understood to mean the same thing because it is coming from the same word. Now, the only difference is one is an action, one is a noun, one is having, one is doing. But they are talking about the same thing, believing God. Right? So you can use them interchangeably in that sense. Another thing, I just, I'm just pointing out different things where, you know, when you study the grammar, when you study the word, the meaning of the word, the nuances of the word, the different meanings of the word, it helps you understand and helps you interpret a little better. You know, this, there's been this big uh, debate. And I'm just uh, giving you, giving us some insight. Can a woman be part of the fivefold ministry? You know, we, we read about the fivefold ministry, Ephesians 4.11. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. So the question is, you know, can a woman be an apostle or a prophet or an evangelist or a pastor or a teacher? Can a woman do that? The big question is because in Ephesians 4 and verse 8, the previous preceding verse, it says that when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So some will say, well, he gave it only to men. So only men can be apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Why? Because verse 8 says that he gave gifts to men. And these are the gifts he gave to men. Well, what is the Greek word for men? Anthropos. That word actually means human being. It's not referring to male or female, it is human being. So it's not saying he gave gifts only to male, he gave gifts unto anthropos, the same word that we said in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, when Jesus said, you know, he quoted from the Old Testament, he said, man shall not live. Well, it's anthropos, human being, male or female. So if Ephesians 4, 8 says he gave gifts unto human beings. Uh, it would not be right to exclude these gifts, ministry gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, only to men, because this word actually is anthropos, male and female. So we must say, okay, it is possible if God calls somebody, a male or female, a human, human being, he may give them these one or more of these gifts and you know we shouldn't restrict and say only male can operate or function in these ministry gifts right so i'm just sharing an uh, example where if you look at the greek it tells you what it is therefore you interpret uh, the things that follow in that light okay so Going back to our PDF, you know, uh, some exercise. This is a little bit of work we have to do, right? And that is, you say, okay, uh, I look up the meaning of the word. How was the word being used? What is the context? How did the writer use the same word in the same book? Uh, if the person has written more books in the Bible, how did he use the same word in other books? Uh, are there other writers who used the same word? How did they use it? And this makes you know, an interesting study. So what we are trying to say is, in understanding the meaning of the word, you not only understand the meaning of the word in the language, but it's also helpful to know how the particular writer was using that word. And I'll give you some examples where, for instance, uh, John, the beloved apostle, who wrote the Gospel of John and the three epistles of John, uh, he uses certain words uh, repeatedly in his letters. 
For example, the word abide is used very often by John. You know, he uses it in the Gospel of John. He uses it a lot in his first epistle of John, abide. So it's like, it's one of his favorite words. So you kind of delve into that word. Oh, John is, what, what, what did it mean to John? Yes, the word abide has its literal meaning, which means to dwell, to remain, to continue, to settle down. That's the literal meaning of that word abide. You can look it up. But you also want to say, in John's mind, in his writing, in his usage of this word, what was he thinking? What was he trying to get across to us? And that we pick up when we look at his usage in the Gospel of John and also in, especially in first epistle of John, chapter five chapters. He uses the word abide a lot. And he's really talking about a place of dwelling in God, a place of, in, you know, if you want to use the word English word, intimacy with God, a close fellowship with God. So for him, when he's talking about abide, he's really talking about a place of very close fellowship with God. Because you can see that coming through from the Gospel of John and the, especially in the Epistle of John. So that's his, you know, um, that's how he's using that word abide. Or, you know, in the writings of the Apostle Paul, of course, there are many words he uses. Uh, um, and like this, let me extend this thought to phrases, right? So we are speaking of words, uh, understanding words, the grammar, the meaning, the tense, and the, um, yeah, the, the part of the speech. But in addition to words, it is also good to see the usage of certain phrases. Example, the Apostle Paul, uses a phrase, pray in the spirit, or praying in the spirit. So, now, many evangelicals will interpret praying in the spirit as to pray with a lot of fervor, to pray with a lot of energy, to pray with a lot of passion. So if you listen to them preach or you read their Bible commentaries, that's how they will interpret prayer in the spirit. Is praying in the spirit is to pray with a lot of fire, to pray with a lot of passion, to play, pray with a lot of uh, energy. But is that what Apostle Paul meant? How do we correctly understand the phrase pray in the spirit? Well, then you have to follow how he used, how did the writer use that phrase in his letters? So for example, he used it in Ephesians 6, 18. Pray always with all prayer and supplication. You know, praying in the spirit. Okay. But what did he mean? Well, you go and look at 1 Corinthians 14. He talks about praying in the spirit as praying in tongues. I will pray with the spirit. If I pray with the Spirit, my understanding is unfruitful. If I pray with the Spirit, my spirit prays. So 1 Corinthians 14, then you understand, hey, when you're praying in the Spirit, according to this writer, that phrase has to do with praying in tongues. And it's not about praying with a lot of fire, a lot of zeal, a lot of passion. That's not how he's using it. In the mind of the writer, the Apostle Paul, praying in the Spirit, it means to pray in tongues because it's very clearly there in 1 Corinthians 14. So then you say, oh, maybe this is a phrase that was understood by all New Testament writers, not just Apostle Paul. Because Jude writes in his epistle, Jude one twenty, he says, you beloved, Build yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit. 
praying in the Holy Spirit. Oh, so that means the New Testament early church understood this phrase like this not praying with a lot of fire and zeal and passion as some of the evangelicals would present it, but in the mind of the New Testament writers, praying in the Spirit was a phrase that they understood as praying in tongues. Because you see its usage in the various letters, um, primarily by the Apostle Paul, and therefore you can say that Jude, who was part of the church in uh, he was a half brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. He grew up in the New Testament uh, in the church in Jerusalem, half brother of James. Uh, uh, they were there in the new uh, church in Jerusalem, the early church. So they understood it to be praying in tongues. So, like this you study the words, look up the meaning, look up the context, look up also how that same writer used that word in his writings to get a full uh, you know to correctly interpret that word as i'm just you know gave you several different examples um, that would help us you know and um, um, uh, in, in correctly interpreting okay so this is how the the, that word, uh, the, this is what the word means, or this is what the sentence means, because I'm looking at the grammar, I'm understanding the meaning, I'm understanding the sentence, I'm understanding how it is being used in that book, but I'm also understanding how the writer is using that word in his writings, so that then I can get the meaning of what is being said okay uh, let me pause here and see if there are any questions on the chat and uh, uh, everybody is okay with me so far any uh, you're understanding this any questions you're getting it All okay. Um, any any questions so far? Pastor. Yes, go ahead. So far, so good. No problem, Pastor. On my side. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Okay. Anyone else? Any questions? Please feel free to ask. No problem asking questions. Okay. So, in keeping with this understanding of grammar. Another aspect of grammar, which of course is you know you find throughout the Bible, is figure of speech. Right. So let's kind of uh, we'll just start it off today, and uh, we will continue this uh, again next week. Let me share the notes. So, figure of speech. That means. Uh, as part of, and this is also part of the language, right? That, and, and we have this in uh, English, uh, and I'm sure, you know, uh, every language has certain words or phrases that are not meant to be taken literally. It's only uh, what in English we say, figure of speech. So, example, you know, uh, we say it's raining hard. That means that word hard just means it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, there's a lot of rain coming. Or sometimes we may say it's raining cats and dogs. Or it's pouring, you know. And those words or phrases are not to be taken literally. For example, let me say, it's raining cats and dogs. It doesn't mean literally cats and dogs are falling from the sky. It's only a figure of speech, but it's telling, you know, somebody who understands the language will understand that it means uh, it's raining very hard. Uh, it's, it's really bad. So like this, even in the scriptures, 
because people were writing uh, in their in the language and in the using the you know the grammar of their time they also used figures of speech and you find this and so we have to understand we first of all recognize something is literal something is a figure of speech and if it's a figure of speech how do i interpret it so that i can apply it correctly so how how do we approach the text of scripture we of course whenever we read the scripture we will take whatever is literal we take it literally unless there is a reason for us to say well the literal is not uh, you know it cannot be taken he is using a figure of speech how do we know he is using a figure of speech if the literal is an impossibility right and that sometimes is very obvious uh so when john pointed to the lord jesus and said this is the lamb of god it's a figure of speech he is giving him a title which is not literal meaning he is not an animal as a lamb but he is going to be like that meaning he is going to be sacrificed like that so it's a figure of speech or uh, when god tells jeremiah jeremiah i have made you an iron pillar and a bronze wall so god is telling jeremiah jeremiah 1:18 jeremiah i've made you an iron pillar i've made you a bronze wall oh that's a figure of speech uh we have to understand it we have to interpret it so we will talk about how to interpret it but obviously jeremiah is not an iron pillar or a bronze wall there it's a figure of speech what does that mean what is the meaning right uh we know that um, uh a figure of speech is being used when the literal meaning is absurd that means literal meaning cannot happen so for example as a 55 and verse 12 says the trees of the field will clap their hands now somebody may point to this and say see uh the bible is uh has errors in it because the bible is saying the trees have hands no 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 it's only a figure of speech so it's not a problem in the bible it's a it's a part of the language uh uh the trees of the field will clap their hands basically saying you know everything around is going to be uh, rejoicing celebrating uh, it's not about that there's error there it's a figure of speech uh we also can understand that the figure of that he is using a figure of speech of the literal would you know is actually would definitely be something wrong For instance, Jesus said, you know, in John chapter six, when he was preaching to the people, he said, "You must eat my flesh and drink my blood." The sad thing is, in John chapter six, people couldn't understand. They were take, trying to take it literally. How can we eat his flesh and drink his blood? What is he saying? So obviously, that is not literal. It's it's figure, a figurative. It's talking about coming into that place of. personal intimacy with the lord relationship with the lord and so on you know or think about the other phrase being born again in john chapter 3 you know nicodemus thought how can a man get back into his mother's womb a second time and be born so he is trying to think it literally jesus said no 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 it's not literal you need to be born of water and the spirit we're talking about spiritual birth right so like this there are many um uh examples where the literal would mean something that's totally um uh, absurd or immoral and then uh, then we say okay it's not literal it's a figure of speech and also in scripture you'll find that sometimes uh the figurative expression is followed by the literal expression so example in first Thessalonians 4 it talks about those who fall asleep 
And then, but then it just goes on to talk about those who have died. So that means when the writer, in this case the Apostle Paul, is talking about falling asleep, he's talking about dying. So, but here there's a big mistake people make. They just go over this phrase, oh, okay, death is just sleeping. That means when somebody dies, the body is just the body and soul and spirit is just sleeping in the ground. No, no, that's not what he's saying. He's saying he's using falling asleep as a figurative expression for dying. But what happens in dying? You know, if it's a believer, like he says that, the spirit goes to be with Jesus. So it's not sleeping. So, you know, uh, you'll find uh, some people come up with this sleep theory. That means when somebody dies, the spirit soul is just sleeping somewhere in the ground. But that's not what Paul was saying. He used this phrase, fall asleep, and explains it immediately. He's talking about dying. And what happens when we die? The spirit goes to be with the Lord. So we have to recognize where a certain phrase is actually a figure of speech. But once you rec recognize it, very important part is how to interpret it. Because like I was giving this example, if you interpret that figure of speech, that uh, phrase incorrectly, you will come up with wrong doctrine like this sleep theory, you know, because they take this phrase, fallen asleep in Jesus. Oh, he's just sleeping. Spirit and soul is in the ground, resting. But that is not what the rest of the scripture teaches. The rest of the scripture teaches that when somebody, when a believer dies, the spirit goes to be with Jesus. It's not sleeping in the ground. So, uh, we recognize the figure of speech, then you interpret the figure of speech correctly. Right? So, uh, a simple thing to do is, uh, we'll, we will just, uh, I don't know if we will have time to finish this, but let's try to cover some thoughts. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, so once you recognize, so we said, how do you recognize a figure of speech? Uh, literalism, impossibility, is that absurd, it's immoral, or, you know, he gives you an uh, explanation right there. Then interpreting it, okay? So you recognize figure of speech. Okay, a believer, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 to 6, a believer is compared to a soldier, an athlete, a farmer. And it's okay. This is just figure of speech, words that are not intended to be literal, but are representative. So it doesn't mean a believer must become a soldier, start using guns and things like that. Or athlete, oh, it's start competing Olympics, or farmer, go by land and start farming. No, he's just using that as a comparison. He's using those, those words as a figure of speech to show certain qualities that a believer must have. And so you recognize, first of all, you determine that, yeah, this is a figure of speech. It's not meant literally. Or in Matthew 7, verse 6, you know, when Jesus says, don't give dogs what is sacred, don't throw your pearls to pigs. Uh, he is not calling people as pigs or people as dogs. It's not like that. There is, it's this figure. He's just trying to get a message across. Right? And then you find out what is the image, what is the non image. That means uh, there is a picture, there is something from our world, uh, there's a picture that, that's being used as a representation of the non-image. In this case, it'd be say the king, the person. So the lamb of God. So the lamb is the picture. The non-image is the literal person, it's Jesus. 
In this case, the picture is that of a soldier, an athlete, a farmer. That's the image. The non-image is the believer. The believer is a literal person. So some aspect of this image is being applied or being used to characterize the non-image, that is the believer. Right? Or when Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days, the temple, uh, the image is the temple, the non-image is, is the body of Jesus Christ. So he's using that picture, the temple, to represent his own body. So once you understand the difference, then very important in number three is this. What is the point or the points of comparison? And don't uh, transfer everything about the point of, about the, uh, between the image and the non-image. There may be sometimes only one point of comparison. The Lamb of God. So the Lamb is talking about something that's innocent. Representing something that's sinless. So that's the point of comparison. But don't say a Lamb has four legs. A Lamb has a lot of wool. So Jesus has four this and he is very warm. Don't say like that. right? That, that is... Uh, uh, doing using points of comparison was not intended by the image. The image of the lamb, when compared to the non-image, that's Jesus. Only one point. The lamb is spotless, innocent. That's Jesus. Similarly, soldier, athlete, farmer. What is the point of comparison? A soldier, he is... You know, and Paul himself says, you know, just as a soldier doesn't entangle himself with the affairs of this life, so we also, you know, that means the soldier is committed to his cause. Athlete, he works hard, he's, you know, he's striving for a goal to win. So that's the point of comparison. The farmer, the farmer works hard and then he has a reward. That's the point of comparison, right? But we don't pull out all the other things. Athlete, oh, you know, uh, he... Um, you know, unnecessary things like maybe he, uh, I'm trying to, you know, he runs very fast or he, you know, he may uh, wear certain type of clothes or those kind of, no, the point of comparison is there in the text. What was he using? You stay with that. Okay. So in interpreting the figure of speech, understand what exactly is, is the reference after and use only that, apply only that to the non-image, to the person or what is being referenced. Okay, I'm going to stop here. We will continue from this uh, next week. Uh, any, any questions? Are you all with me, following me so far? Oh, uh, yes, I have a question. Yes. Um, but I've heard some interpretation of Abraham sacrificing uh, Isaac, uh, the, the incident that happened. And um, some interpretation which I've heard is the reason behind God asking Abraham to do so is uh, because his love to Isaac uh, was more than uh, what used to be earlier with um let's say uh, he used to love god more when isaac came his love shifted towards isaac and that's the reason he wanted to test abraham so is it right to interpret like that or uh, uh, how do we uh, you know when we listen to such interpretations how do we take it yeah so first of all when you hear such statements you immediately know it's not given in scripture the Bible doesn't say that. So that means this is something the preacher is adding to the Bible. Like It's not there in the Bible. The Bible never said Abram had greater affection to Isaac. Therefore, the Lord tested him. Genesis 22, 1 simply says, And the Lord tested Abraham, saying, Take your son, your only son, Isaac. But nowhere in Scripture does the Scripture say that Abraham had great affection. So, Immediately, you know, this is a point that the 
preacher is adding. It's not in the Bible. It may be true. It may not be true. Because, you know, the, maybe the whole reason God wanted to test Abraham could be, you know, in Hebrews chapter 11, to, uh, to point to Christ himself, to do, a, you know, a, a type of Christ. Or it could be to test his commitment to the Lord. But, you know, uh, we can't say for sure because it's not stated in this text. So uh, if we were preaching and we would say, you know, I would definitely say, okay, maybe this could have been the reason, but it's not, I would clearly say it's not in the Bible. It's just my opinion, right? So if we are doing the preaching, we should make very clear that what is our opinion and what is the Bible? But when you hear something like this being preached immediately in your mind, you say, hey, this is not in the Bible. This is the preacher's opinion. It may or may not be true. So maybe it could be true. Maybe it's not. But we can't verify it because it's not in the Bible. Leave it aside, you know, and uh, don't pay too much attention to it. Sure, Basia. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. All right. So uh, good. Let's pause here today. We will continue this next week. Uh, could somebody just close in prayer and we will dismiss. Father, we want to thank you for this time. Thank you for uh, revealing uh, your scriptures. Thank you for revealing the mysteries. We pray, oh God, that we would be able to co um, continue learning, continue adapting what you have taught us. We pray, oh God, that you would be able to rightly interpret the scripture as you have intended it to be Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. Father, we submit all of us as a class to your presence. We uh, uh, we thank you for Pasashish to reveal your word to us, O oh God. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, I'll see you again next week. God bless everybody. Bye now. Bye.